Okay. Today's guest is super cool. This is Chad E. Foster. He's a motivational keynote speaker, a sales and finance leader, and inspirational change agent who works at Red Hat um, IBM. He was the first blind executive to graduate from Harvard Business School's program for leadership development. So despite going blind in his early 20s while he was in college, he then um, graduated and got hired at a top consulting firm, Accenture, and has built a career in the technology industry where he's directed financial strategies and decisions resulting in more than $45 billion in contracts. Um, he now speaks to corporate audiences and professional athletes to help them develop resilience in the face of uncertainty. And he lives with his wife and two children in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, so he also has a book called Blind Ambition and he's talking about some of the points in that book. And it's just like, I think you're going to love Chad because his, his approach to this path that he's been on has been so like, he's almost, he's just like no big deal. <laughs> no, I just did what I had to do. And, um, he shares, um, the turning point. Cause you know, obviously he had, had achieved a lot of business success. He wasn't really ever planning on uh, being a keynote speaker or anything like that. And so he shares a moment, um, while he was at Harvard, where he realized like he was feeling this pool to be able to do this. And it's just so cool to hear him talk about that path of going through something so hard. Like, can you imagine being in your early twenties? and you're in college and now you're losing all, you're going completely blind. That would be so hard. And the way he was able to pull himself out of that and change his stories around it is just so amazing to hear. So we'll go ahead and get into it. Here is Chad E. Foster. Before we jump into the show, I am extremely honored to share with you the sponsor of this podcast, and that is Rep Provisions. And I want to tell you a little bit about who they are, what they're about. They are a regenerative agriculture company. They are a ranch. I have been to the ranch myself. Incredible. And if you aren't familiar with regenerative agriculture, it is my extreme honor to introduce you. So here's a few statistics of why regenerative agriculture is important before I get into what it is. First of all, the United States is losing topsoil 10 times faster then it's replenishing it right now. And this comes from our modern conventional agriculture practices that we've really just developed in the last several decades. The way we are raising cattle and the way we are growing these monocrops of plants is depleting our topsoil at astronomical rates. And I love the way Eric Perner, the founder uh, and owner of Rep Provisions, the rancher there at the ranch, I love how he puts this. He says that our planet is just a giant rock spinning in space with a tiny layer of topsoil and subsoil that supports all life on the planet. Every economy, every nation is sustained by this layer of topsoil. It's really important, right? We don't have any soil or quality soil. Health goes down and then eventually life goes away, right? So it's, it's so important. Um, right now, we're losing about 75 billion tons of topsoil every year because as it erodes from these conventional farming practices, it goes into the waterways and then goes into the ocean and we lose it. So it's not sustainable, obviously, and we have to regenerate the topsoil. And this is where regenerative agriculture comes in. And the way they raise their animals is supportive of regeneration of the topsoil. So you can listen to my podcast episode with Eric Perner if you want to learn more about exactly how they do it. It's so important. Now, from a health perspective, this is so cool. Um, Eric just shared with me that they had their meat lab tested at Michigan State University. And if you're not familiar with omega-6 to omega-3 ratios, let me share this with you real quick. So omega-6s are pro-inflammatory. They're in all foods. Omega-3s are anti-inflammatory. So this is all foods have a certain ratio of omega-6 to omega-3. Now, the ideal is one-to-one, -one, right? So we balance out that pro-inflammatory aspect of food, which is important. It triggers a lot of things in our body, but we balance it with the anti-inflammatory effect. On average, Americans are 10-to-one. Their omega-6 to omega-3 ratio is 10-to-one because honestly, we eat so much canola oil and so many processed foods and all the way up to 30-to-one and higher. It's super inflammatory, causes heart disease, cancer, all disease. Um, grain fed meat is on average five to one ratio or worse. And what came back from Michigan state university is that rep provisions meat has a one to one omega six to omega three ratio, which is freaking huge. Um, so, so cool. I'm so glad they found that out. And by the way, just FYI, grain fed chicken has a 15 to one ratio and seed oils are the worst like canola. Um, so we mean all these industrial seed oils, 70 to one 
or worse. And they estimate that 25% of the calories in the American diet come from canola oil. No wonder there's so much disease. No wonder everyone's so unhealthy. So just wanted to share that with you guys. This is not only an amazing way to support the planet, but also your own health. Um, and they're giving you guys an awesome discount. It's one of the highest discounts they offer 15% off anything with code coach Tara. So I'll link that in the show notes, or you can go to repprovisions.com anytime and just use the coupon code coach Tara and get 15% off. All right. So Chad, welcome. It's so good to have you here. And I, you know, we talked a little bit before the show and I was like, you were like, what do you want me to talk about? I'm like, resilience, please I could talk about resilience through hard times. You know, I mean, like you have been yeah. educated on the school of hard knocks, as you say, you know, so could you t- tell us, you know, a little bit of your background on how you learned resilience at another level? Sure. Yeah. Growing up, you know, I played sports, I played football, I played basketball, I played soccer, I wrestled. I like to race bikes and, and motorcycles and cars. And, and then when I was studying in college at the University of Tennessee, I went blind completely doing it due to an inherited retinal condition. And, you know, they, uh, they'd always told me when I was a, a youngster, the doctors did at some point I could go blind, but when you're 16 years old, you're invincible. And I, I never really prepared, right? I never really took it seriously because I just thought it wasn't going to happen to me. I thought, everything was fine. I was able to do things that other children with my eye condition couldn't do like sports and riding uh, motorcycles and jet skis and things like that. So I thought I was going to be the outlier, but when I was in college at 21 years old, while everyone else is preparing for their adventures of adult life, what are they, what are they going to be? What are they going to study for? I ended up going blind and you know, we ask kids all the time, what do you want to be when you grow up? And guess what? None of them said they want to be a blind person. So it was a pretty difficult experience for me, just being confronted with the harsh reality that, you know what? I was never going to be able to see another sunset. I was never going to be able to see my future wife, never see my future children. Mm. Everything that I had known up until that point and it, how I saw myself, my self-image was all visual in nature. But when you can't see yourself in the mirror, it's pretty hard to see yourself as a, as a visual person. And so that was a difficult time because I, I was studying to go into the medical field because I wanted to help other people. But then after I went blind, I wasn't even sure if I could help myself. Wow. Yeah, that's... Um... <laughs> there's so much uh, emotion, you know, that I feel inside of me just hearing you say that it's like, you're, you're summing it up into a nice, concise paragraph, but like the emotion that must have been been going through you at that time is like almost inconceivable, especially at that age. Right. It's like all your hopes and dreams and ambitions. And I'm sure it's just like, yeah. must've been the biggest, like knock the wind out of you punch to your stomach. Um, a lot to process that most people never ha- even have, have to think about that. Right. Like it's just yeah. not, hasn't entered your arena. Um, I'm, <laughs> I hope you don't mind me asking, but like, no, what, as a result of finding that out and you're, you're in them in, in college, like, you know, how did that, how did that impact you? Like socially, emotionally, you know, like did, I feel like I would have like withdrawn or it would have been very, he- a very heavy time. What oh, was that? It was. Yeah. yeah, it was rough. It was really rough. And so I channeled my frustrations into at first it was partying, right. Trying right. to just kind of numb the feelings of frustration. I was embarrassed about it. I was ashamed Mm. of it. It was ashamed of the fact that I couldn't see as well as other people. I would walk around on campus and sometimes I would bump into people because I wasn't able to see as well. And people would think, oh, is he, is he drunk? Is he stoned? What's going on? And in fact, I just, I couldn't see that well. Wow. And it was a really, it was difficult socially for me. It was difficult emotionally for me, psychologically for me. Mm -hmm. And for a long, long time, you know, for months and months, I just, I felt sorry for myself. Right. Um, And so I finally decided, you know what, Um, I can keep feeling sorry for myself for the rest of my life. I'm 20 something years old. That means I'm going to be feeling sorry for about another 50 years. Mm. And that's a whole lot of sorry, right? I wasn't Mm. ready for that. So I (laughs) finally came to the realization that I can sit around and 
I can let this dominate my thinking for a long, long time and it can ruin my life, but I'm not going to get a do-over in my life. Mm. Nobody gets a do-over. So sometimes we don't like the cards that were dealt. What are we going to do? Well, in the game of life, you don't get a do-over, right? This is it. It's the only one you've got. So you can sit around and find reasons to be unhappy or you can choose a different path. And so fortunately for me, I ended up finding a, a different path. Wow. And how did that, how did that start? You know, like where, where did you start on the, the process of choosing this different path? And for, for, before you answer that, I just have to say like that right there, like what you highlighted of, it's just, it's a choice, you know? And yes, like many of us have faced tragedy or deep, deep, sad, hard times. Um, and not to, not to mitigate that. Now, you know, I think it's healthy to feel all the feelings and process and mourn or sure. grieve or all of those things. Yeah. Um, but you know, what is this like this? It's like, okay, I'm just going to choose to get over it. You know, people are like, no, you know, like what did that process look like <laughs> for you starting down that path? Well, I think you, you break, you, you bring up a, a really great point and the normal reaction is poor me and yeah. Oh my God, you know, why me is the question that everybody asks. I asked that question countless times. Yeah. And I I just kept wondering, you know, why me? I felt like a victim. I'd been victimized by this eye condition. And, you know, for a long time, I allowed that to, to dominate. But I think the decision that we all have to come to in our lives is whenever something bad happens to us, it's normal to feel those emotions. Yeah. It's like when the tide comes in, right? The tide comes in, the tide goes out, waves come in, waves go out. That's kind of like emotions. How long are we going to allow the waves of emotion in our life control our happiness? Emotions are normal. They wax and they wane. Yeah. I just decided that I was going to put some time restrictions on how long I allowed Mm. those feelings of sadness to dominate me. And there's a, there's a choice that you have to make at some point that, you know what, I'm not going to let this control me for the rest of my life. I'm not going to live in misery. You know, I knew that for the rest of my life, I was going to be blind, but I didn't want to be blind and bitter, right? The the blindness for me was guaranteed, but my attitude was completely up to me. And so in college, I started thinking about, I like to do this mental exercise. Uh, It's Chad time travel. So I fast forward in my life and Mm. I look back on the decisions that I made in my life. Mm. And what can I live with? What can future Chad live with? Is it, well, life was hard. And so you didn't get what you wanted out of your life. Is that going to comfort me when I'm older? Probably not. And so (laughs) is it, is it good for me to just say, well, I got a bad hand of cards that I was dealt and life's hard and life sucks, or am I going to instead choose a different path? Because if we don't get what we want out of our lives, who's the person that ultimately pays for that? So we can all find legitimate excuses, but I really believe that excuses are for losers. And I don't mean that in a harsh way. I mean, in just a matter of fact way, I can sit around and I can find legitimate excuses to not get what I want out of my life. We all can But if you find a legitimate excuse to fail, how does that help you? Do you really want to find a legitimate excuse to fail? I don't. I want to find a a way to to move through whatever obstacle I have, because I know that at the end of my life, I have to be accountable for my life and my outcomes. I may not be responsible for all of my circumstances, but it's my life. I've got to own it. If nobody's going to own my life, you know, it, it has to be me, right? Who else is going to own my life for me? Who's going to own your life for you? Nobody. So regardless of what circumstances you're dealt, and none of us are responsible for all of those circumstances, but you better be accountable for your life because nobody else is going to be. So well said. Yeah, it's, there's, um, generally I find, (laughs) unfortunately, it usually takes hitting a pretty hard low before a lot of us discover this, that we are actually in charge of not only our lives, but also our, uh, our thoughts and that we can choose different thoughts and we can choose to look at things from a different 
lens and have a different story about it. Yeah. And I noticed on your, on your website, right on your um, homepage, which is chadefoster.com, by the way, you guys, um, and you can also get his book there. So just letting you guys know the blind ambition, if you're watching on YouTube behind him, um, you can find it there, but you, I love, I would, I, you know, I was getting ready for this interview and I saw that you wrote, um, that on there, it says Chad uses his gift of going blind to teach and inspire us to thrive with change, create a more resilient leadership culture and invite diversity to drive business innovation. And we haven't even gotten into your business side of things, which is really freaking amazing. Um, but the, the, the word choice of gift of going blind. Wow. Like what a, a different attitude than when you first found out. So like, how, how have you learned to see this as a gift? Well, I, I often refer to it as the gift, the beautiful gift of blindness that came disguised in some really ugly wrapping paper, <laughs> you know, because who wants to open that gift? Like, no. wow, you know, <laughs> blindness. Thanks. I appreciate that. Can I, can I get lottery ticket instead? Lottery yeah. ticket would be good or, yeah. you know, born into uh, maybe a wealthy family or nope, <laughs> didn't get that either. So it was, I got blind. Okay. Thanks. It's great. So uh could be worse, but it, 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 um, I didn't think of it as a gift when it, when it first happened, obviously. And, but what I've learned over the course of my life is that I'm actually a better person now because of my blindness and not in spite of it. I think I am more successful because I'm blind, because after I went blind, well, before I went blind, things came easily to me, right? School came easily to me. I didn't have to work that hard to make good grades. Had a had a talent, you know, a great memory. Was really good at math. Just if things in science, uh, you know, I didn't have to work that hard to make good grades. And then after going blind, you know, it, what didn't come so easily. I had to, mm. I had literally had to relearn how to learn when I was in college. Wow. And and I was a visual learner, which you know. Yeah. to find out it's not very helpful when you're blind, you know, when you're oh, a visual learner. Dang. So I had to become an audio-based learner. My mom entered the scene and heroically read every single one of my business books to audio for me. Wow. And you know what? Her selfless actions inspired me to be more versatile. Wow. And I ended up, it turns out, I was a better blind student than sighted student. I I made straight A's from that point forward. I made the wow. dean's list and ended up getting a job with a top consulting firm. So, I mean, maybe I should have gone blind sooner, but it, it forced me to improve my perspective and my focus and my effort and my determination because things didn't come as easily. Things haven't come as easily, but I, I, I'll say that, do we all want things to come easily right. in our lives? Because if things come easily to you, how much fulfillment and joy do you get out of those things? If someone just hands you something, say it's admission to a school, say it's a career promotion, say it's a, it's a savings account with a certain amount of money in it. Right. If they hand you that versus you go out and you sweat and you bleed and you yeah. commit yourself for it, which one are you going to appreciate more? Exactly. And I learned that, you know, by my experiences going blind, having to work that much harder to get to where I'm at, I, I really appreciate it more. And I, I discovered that, and this was, you know, you mentioned the business side of things, just a quick thumbnail on that to give some context for when I discovered it, it was my gift uh, that, that um, all this occurred to me. So I was in the technology industry for some time. And then I ended up, I was working at a, at a technology company and I was doing, I've done everything from writing software to marketing, to consulting. And in this particular job, I was a senior director for our pricing strategy and solutions group. And so we ran and chased multi-billion dollar contracts that were sold to the U S federal government. And we had had a pretty good run, right? I brought in over $45 billion in contracts. And the company came to me and said, you know what, Chad, you've done a lot of good for us. What can we do for you? And for some crazy reason, I said, you know what, send me to Harvard. And for some crazier reason, they said, okay. So wow. They sent me to HBS. And so I go to Harvard Business School and I'm studying there. And the class that I'm in 
is called Authentic Leadership with Bill George, who's a senior fellow there at Harvard, and he's the chair and former chair and CEO of Medtronic. And phenomenal, phenomenal leader. And he's talking about how we can discover our true north. Hmm. And as he's talking about how you can mine moments in your life that presented you a significant amount of emotional, whether it's trauma or otherwise, things that really connected with you on a visceral level. Mm. And if you can take those, those moments and then pivot those into an area where you've got talent and an opportunity to have professional success. So basically combining mm. these emotional moments where you can find your purpose and linking that to your profession and your talent, that's where you can get the most amount of meaning. And so as he's telling me, as he's teaching this, a lot of people in my class, fellow classmates are looking around, trying to figure out well, what's mine, what's mine. And they're thinking, and mine just smacked me in the face. It was so obvious to me, like, wow, you know, people had always told me that I'd inspired them when I was just trying to get to my next goal in life. I wasn't really doing anything mm. other than trying to <laughs> get my next promotion, like the rest of us, right? Just All grinding right. like most of us do. And then it was there that I was elected to speak at our graduation class. And mm. for the first time, I used my story intentionally to try and reach somebody. And so I gave a short 12-minute talk. Wasn't thinking too much of it, but it affected people in a way that evening that I could have never anticipated. And in fact, it affected me in a way I never could have anticipated. Mm. That awesome. night, so there was uh, one guy who decided to commission an opera based on what I said that night. Another guy comes up to me. And he's literally, he's crying in my arms because come to find out his daughter had died the year before to cancer. Okay. And something I said that evening helped him. Mm. Now I'm not Tara, I'm not a naturally real soft and fuzzy person. Right. <laughs> but when you have a parent crying in your arms, because something you said helped them process the loss of their daughter, mm -hmm it changes you, right? It completely changes you. And so yeah. I started looking at it as you know, there's an opportunity here for me to do something with this beyond just me. Now, you know, I'm not going blind for just me. If I use this to help other people see their lives more clearly, then it gives it more value. All of a sudden, I didn't go blind for just Chad. There's an opportunity to help other people. So now I'm convinced that I lost my vision to help other people find theirs. Wow. So that's my gift. Wow. And like, it's, it's so beautiful. I love this story so much because I'm so inspired by people who just <laughs> were kind of like minding their own business, just living life, doing what they were wanting to do, being passionate, just working, getting stuff done. And all of a sudden they kind of like find out that it's inspiring people. And they're like, Oh, it is. I had no idea versus yeah. like, <laughs> I, I'm right. Okay. I'm getting kind of a bad person, but like, sometimes there's like, I want to be true. a motivational speaker. And it's like, about what? And it's like, I don't know yet. And it's like, right. no, I'm going to motivate somebody. Watch <laughs> that's not how this works. Um, and so I love that you're yeah. just like being a badass, just crush at $45 billion in contracts you help pull in for these companies. I mean, that's just insane. And I can't, I can only imagine like the effect that you must've had on people around you that they didn't even realize. Cause they're like, dude, Chad's killing it. And like, he can't even see. So like, what am I doing? You know, it kind of is like that effect, but also on top of it, it's just, it is human nature. As you mentioned, you did go through that period of like, poor me, you know, like it, yeah. it, in a way you were a victim, you were victimized by this in, in a way. Right. But one thing that I um, talk about with my clients is like, there's a difference between a like a, a victim mentality in which you are just, there's nothing you can do. It's just all on you, but there's also like an empowered victim where you come out of it. It's like, yeah, I went through something freaking hard and here's all the stuff I learned from that, that I can now go and share with other people and use it in my life to share wisdom. And for me, I think that is the greatest gift. One of my most favorite things in the world is meeting new people and getting into an in-depth conversation about anything that they've learned in life, yeah, because yeah. it's like the cliff's notes of a whole nother lifetime of wisdom, you know, That's and right. just seeing That's how right. they think and how they feel and what they've learned. It's just invaluable. And I'm really glad you wrote a book. Um, somebody put it to me this way once, like for like $20 or so, 
you can literally download all of the wisdom that somebody beautifully wrote in an enjoyable way for you to take in. And you didn't have to like live that life yourself, you know? So it's like, exactly. it's so, so valuable. Which is, which is why I, that's exactly why I wrote the book because now I speak all over the world. I've spoken to leaders on six continents, right? I've spoken to leaders from companies like Google and Bank of America and Microsoft, but you know, not everybody gets to go to a conference. So how do I reach people yeah. where they are? And that's why I wrote Blind Ambition. By the way, the subtitle of the book, you'll love this, is how to go from victim to visionary. So nice. I'm a big believer in mindset and moving where you want to be because having a victim mindset, we uh, will inevitably limit your potential. But if you have a visionary mindset, that's where you can really unleash your potential, right? And get that post-traumatic growth that Carol Dweck talks so much about in her research. And it really is about how you choose to look at the situation. Yeah. And Nietzsche said, if, if we, if we know the why we're empowered to go through any how, Right. Mm-hmm. And so it's not mm-hmm. what happens to you. It's how you choose to attach meaning to those events yes. and the meaning you attach to those events are far more significant than just the facts alone. I also love, I love that so much. Uh, Carol Dweck's book mindset was one of my, like the first, the introduction to my new life that I live now versus my old one, where I was in victim mentality and didn't even know it, you know, and just not sure. living my true path. But I love the way you described, um, the, the moment where your, your purpose comes in and it's like this visceral, um, it's it, to me that really describes like where vision is born to, you know, I think in that moment where your professor was talking about, um, this basically post-traumatic growth and having your true North and all of that, it's, um, it's, it's such a, it's such a life-changing moment. I've, I've experienced a similar uh, path where you are in your ultimate low and you're so down. And when you find purpose in it, I mean, it's, 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 it is like, I I'm so grateful that happened in a way it, it changes your whole story about it so much. And I'm curious, um, cause you were only like, you know, in your early twenties when this happened, And now you're, you know, you're teaching leaders all over the world about mindset. You know, what has your path been on mindset? Cause it's, I feel like it's been a a combination of just through the school of hard knocks, but obviously I'm sure you've had some other resources that you've learned from. So like, if somebody's like, okay, dude, give me what you got, (laughs) where do you start somebody else on this path of like finding purpose and meaning in their, uh, post-traumatic growth as you refer to? Well, uh... So I think finding purpose and meaning, I think Bill George's book is, is an excellent book, Discover Your True North. It's not yeah. only a good read, but it's also a handbook, right? And there are exercises mm. that you can go through and mm. it's something, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way to read and reflect and really it's all about self-discovery. And so it, it involves mm. some journaling and ways to to really think about what were the moments in my life and what could connect with me on Mm. a deeply emotional level and how might I learn how to pivot into this as a profession and and quite frankly you know to what you said earlier I was a bit if I'm being completely honest when my purpose occurred to me it scared the hell out of me Mm. because I was doing pretty good. I'm sitting here. I <laughs> built a career at Harvard. I'm sitting at Harvard, like, okay, yeah. I made it. I'm at Harvard. This is great. I've won all these contracts and doing pretty well professionally. And then all of a sudden I was just struck with this stark realization wow. that I was going to have to be a beginner all over again. Like, <laughs> wow. I went from, you know, being this really successful business strategist right. to, okay, uh, I've never given a talk before. I've never written a book before. I've never taught anybody anything. I was the guy who people would come up and go, Hey, you're really inspiring. And I was, I thought to myself like, Hey, thanks. I like your shoes too. You know, (laughs) not to to discount it, but I I didn't see myself like that. That wasn't how I saw myself. (laughs) I was just, I was hustling like the next person. And yeah, yeah, I had some obstacles that were different. I, I had to relearn how to learn. I had to learn how to write code to engineer my own software without being able to see my computer screen just to use my computer. So I built software that Oracle couldn't figure out how to do uh, for one of their CRM systems so that blind people 
could use their software. And I just did it because it had to be done. I didn't know any better. I was just doing it. And to use Excel as an example, right? Because I wow. used a lot of Excel being in pricing. I wrote over 13,000 lines of code for my own software so that it would integrate with Excel so that I could use the very sophisticated models that we had. I you know, would use a set of models that I built. It was hundreds of Excel files pre-linked together where you could run scenarios and uh, whether it's the pricing tables or PL or ROI or IRR cash flow modeling, all these different things on a managed services deal that's you know a $5 billion deal and you have 50 partners. And so I ended up having to build all this extra stuff to wow. do it. And I just did it because it had to be done. And and uh, <laughs> and actually my blindness gave me an advantage in doing it because this is kind of a, a little nuance, but I, I had to I had to write code to make my own software work with Excel. So when I needed to build an advanced Excel model, well. Given the fact that I've been coding in the Excel's backend libraries, it was pretty easy to do that. So it, wow. it actually gave me an advantage on some of these deals that I was working on because I really understood how to build the right modeling architecture and I understood more about technology because I was so reliant upon it. So wow. I, I guess my point is I never really, I never really saw myself that way. And so when the realization hit me that this there's a light over here and I need to follow this light and explore this. For me, it wasn't a moment of relief as much as it was terror. It was for wow. me, it was like, oh my gosh, I've got to start all over again. I've been pretty good at this other thing. Are you sure I just yeah. can't keep doing that? <laughs> wow. Wow. Well, nothing to keep you young and, <laughs> and learning and growing, you know, and I, it's, it's, I love, thank you for sharing that story. Cause it's like, you were going to be successful either way. You know, if you kept your eyesight or lost it, you were going to be successful in what you were doing. And it's, it's like, it's beautiful in a way that like you were able to give the gift of like, Hey, you know what, guess what? Blind people can't actually do this stuff. And you were able to use the intelligence and the way your mind works, um, to be able to like give that gift to other people, you know, something that would never, never have dawned on you before. And I love your mentality of like, I wasn't trying to like be a, you know, <laughs> like a saint or something. I just needed it so I could do my job, <laughs> right. but it's, it's a beautiful right. ripple effect of that, you know? Um, so, so incredible. Um, so I'm curious when you go into work with businesses now, cause now, I mean, you've been working with, you've been consulting for a while and business strategy and all of this, but now it's, a, it's totally in a different realm, right? You're doing more of mm -hmm. mindset with businesses. Yeah. So yeah, what exactly. are some of the common, you know, um, I, I guess things that you're teaching businesses when you go in to speak to them now, like what are people asking for in terms of helping their business from like a mindset uh, standpoint? Well, obviously resilience is a, is a huge one right now. I talk about resilience. And so I like to talk about how do I connect inspiration to implementation? How do I pour the concrete and the foundation cool. with my story? And then, okay, it's great. You've got a great story, Chad. That's awesome. So what about me? Um, you know, I'm sitting in the front row. I didn't go through that. I've got some, some things going on in my house and my family. I've got a couple of kids in high school. They're a little difficult to deal with. And, you know, I'd like to get to my next promotion. What about me? How do I apply that to my life? And so I, I talk about resilience through, through that lens, obviously relating mm -hmm. my experiences to them so that they can apply it to their own lives. And at the back of my book, Blind Ambition, I put some exercises that do that. And I also do mm -hmm. workshops with them along those lines. And I also talk a lot about choice. And so there's the the choice to be happy. And so in, in mm. my signature talk, Blind Ambition, I talk about five main themes. One is, is how do you connect? Um, how do you choose happiness? And then how do you tell yourself the right stories, which is the, the mm. actually the building blocks of resilience? And then how do you visualize greatness in your unchangeable circumstances? Third point, and then how do you get comfortable with this comfort, which is really, really key. Mm -hmm. And then the, the fifth one is how can you take advantage of your disadvantages? And so I, I talk a lot about, it, it's about being accountable, but it's, it's about um, facing your fears and doing so with confidence and, and how those, those five elements, we talked a little bit about choosing happiness and we've not spent as much time about telling yourself the right stories and mm. visualizing greatness and, and uh, getting comfortable with discomfort and taking advantage of your disadvantages. But those are, those are key. And, 
in my opinion, in shaping mindset. And, and obviously they all kind of feed into resilience. Um, resilience is sort of a, a broader thing, but also, like I said, I take it, take it down to the, so what about me? Cause I, when I read blind ambition, you know, wrote it, step back, read it, read it, read it, and just kept feeling yeah, something's missing. If, if I'm a reader of this, something is missing. It's the, Hey, that was a good story. And it was entertaining and I learned a lot, but so what, and now what, and, and mm -hmm. that's where the exercises came from. And that's where the workshop came from. Wow. 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 I, yeah. Stories. Um, I've been working with a woman for the last three and a half years who facilitates the work of Byron Katie, which is basically working on your stories, the stories you have about things. Right. And so, yeah, if your story is you were a victim, then you're going to be feel disempowered and ripped off and mad and angry and unable to forgive and all of those things. Yeah. But if you can switch the story around, you're yeah. living in a completely different reality, a completely different energy, a completely different mind space that impacts your physical physical health, all of it. So that that's huge. But one thing, one, the, the one thing that really stood out to me, um, on your, on your five parts there of the book is taking advantage of your disadvantages. You know, your other things you're saying are really resonate with me, but I'm like, wow, what do you mean by that? Could you elaborate on that one a little bit? Sure. I think every situation in our lives, uh, can offer us certain advantages if we put it in the right context. And what I mean by that is, how can you take advantage of your disadvantages? I'll, I'll give you an example. I like to go snow skiing. And I started snow skiing about seven years ago. That's and amazing. That's amazing. I, I, I didn't, sorry to cut you off. I didn't tell you this when you we, could. when we talked about me living in Utah before the show, but yeah. I can't, I'm scared to death of skiing. <laughs> I, it's like, you want to see me shaking like a leaf. Yeah. It scares me. So I'm like, that is amazing. <laughs> okay. Please keep going. <laughs> well, and the fear, and this is the advantage. The fear comes from what your eyes are telling you, right? That fear. Mm. And that's where I have an advantage. I am not wow. intimidated by what my eyes are telling me. I was skiing and I was in Aspen, mm. Colorado a couple of years ago. And I was there with my lifelong friend and ski guide. He ski, he guides me now when we go skiing. And I'd been skiing for a few years. And, and by this time, I had made such great progress. We just we were going to do a double black. And so for your listeners who aren't familiar with the double black, these are literally the steepest and most dangerous slopes. They're littered with really jagged rocks and narrow cliffs and oh uh, narrow passageways and, and really big cliffs. So it's like there's death at every turn. <laughs> and, um, you know, Sounds like it's a great place for a blind guy, right? I mean, what's what could possibly go wrong? So we're we're in we're in front of the warning sign. We're taking pictures at Cirque Headwall in Aspen, Colorado, Snowmass to be more specific, Cirque Headwall. And we take pictures there in front of the warning sign and we're getting ready to release down the hill. And my friend Paul turns to me and goes, Man, Chad, you should be really thankful you can't see what's around us right now because <laughs> it's absolutely terrifying. Oh my but gosh. You see, most people when they're on the mountain, they are just staring wide-eyed at that treacherous terrain. They're looking at it going, oh my gosh, I can't do this. I can't do this. Whereas I'm not looking at any of that. I'm just right. focused on taking the next turn. And wow. I often wonder how often does that happen in your life? How often is there this bold vision of greatness that inspires you to take action? But if you're focused on that big, scary goal that you've got for yourself, yeah. when it's time to execute, it can prevent you from taking action. And so yeah. you need this grand vision of greatness in your life. You want a grand vision of right. greatness so that you can be your best self. But when you're on the mountain and it's time to execute, if you're focused on that vision, it will scare you out of making that next turn. So yeah. I think, you know, metaphorically speaking, this happens in our lives all the time. It's about taking that next best action in our careers and in our personal lives and everything else. But on the slopes, it offers me an advantage because I'm not distracted by what my eyes are telling me. I'm just literally, I don't, I don't look at a mountain top to bottom and go, I have to ski 6,000 feet of elevation to get to the bottom. I just see, I've got to make a left turn. Wow. I've got to make a right turn. I've got to make a left turn. I've got to make a right turn. And so by breaking 
the double black diamond down into bite-sized steps is not as intimidating. Looking at it top to bottom is obviously a pretty terrifying thing based on what everybody's told me. Wow. That is such an amazing analogy. I, I love that because, you know, I do goal setting with my clients and I've definitely found the same thing. It's, I'm like, it's, it's great to visualize. It's great to go into, you know, you're at a, it's great to go into Z and just like, see it, feel it, be in that energy, like, Mm -hmm. you know, connect to it emotionally. But if that's all you're connected to, it's just like, I have to be at Z now. I mean, that's like jumping off the mountain and trying to get down to the bottom, right? Like yeah, it's going to yeah, be kind of scary, <laughs> right? But, you know, so it's like, okay, that's cool. Like put it out there, release it. And like, let's come back to B like what, where do, what, what's next? Okay. You want to get a job as a personal trainer at a gym? Okay, cool. That's next. You know, before you can go do this big, huge thing that you want to do, you know? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I, man, that's such a beautiful analogy of that. I can, I, I can feel that. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's exactly what <laughs> paralyzes me with the skiing is just like, I can see the cliff coming and I don't know how to stop. I can, and it I can scares help me. You. you, you and I, next time I'm in Utah, we'll go skiing. I'll get you to put a blindfold on. <laughs> that actually probably you're exactly right. It would, it would, I mean, I'd be a little scared at first, <laughs> but it probably would help me get past it. <laughs> Oh, you wouldn't man. be as intimidated. I promise you. It, it, well, <laughs> I mean, we would, we would obviously, you know, and that's the other thing about goal setting is my first slope wasn't a double black, right? I started on nice. the magic carpet and the bunny slopes and you start where consequences of failure are, are lower. First, right. it's just getting comfortable with the concept. You know what? I can't see. And I'm knowingly and willingly strapping yeah. these skis to my feet and getting on the <laughs> side of a mountain, which inherently doesn't sound like a very wise thing to do right but you you start you start edging outside of your comfort zone and you notice your comfort zone start to expand which quite frankly i believe is one of the reasons i've been able to flourish despite my condition i think i've lived my life my entire life has been an experiment of living outside of my comfort zone and so from a very early age i heard that i was going to go blind that was uncomfortable. And then I lost my eyesight when I was in college, as I mentioned. That was uncomfortable. Learning the limitations of my eyesight was physically uncomfortable. It was socially uncomfortable. It was emotionally uncomfortable. I had to relearn who I wanted to be. I had to reinvent myself. All those things were uncomfortable. And then I got my first guide dog. And walking into a classroom and then a, a job interview, and then a conference room with a, with a guide dog was uncomfortable. And then here I am going to the airport, traveling to a city that I've never been. That was uncomfortable. And then next thing I know, I'm traveling to Europe and Asia by myself, just wow. me and the guide dog, not being able to see, not being able to speak the language. Wow. That was uncomfortable. <laughs> and, yeah. and before I know it, you know, I'm skiing down black and double black diamonds without being able to see. When you start expanding outside of your comfort zone, just ebbing slightly outside of your comfort zone, your comfort zone begins to expand. And when it does, you'll realize once you get comfortable with that feeling of discomfort, that's where growth takes place. Life begins outside of your comfort zone. If you're never getting outside of your comfort zone, then you're never growing. And who wants to live a life without growth? So I think my blindness forced me to get comfortable with discomfort. And so now I I really believe that comfort is the same as complacency is stagnation. And so I try to continually put myself in a position of discomfort, much to the chagrin of my family when I tell them like, hey, I got a great idea. We're going to go helicopter skiing this winter. And they're like, you're going to do what? Wow. (laughs) Yeah. Don't you feel like after a while, uh, not feeling discomfort begins to feel, um, I don't know the word for it, depressing almost (laughs) like once you're comfortable with being outside of your comfort zone, it's that becomes the more comfortable place because the, the alternative, I feel like it's just, it, it, it does. It feels like stagnation. It just feels so uneventful. And what was that? Who wants to do something that's routine? It's so boring. It's so boring. It's so routine. <laughs> yeah. And right. Yeah. It's boring yeah. because there's no, there's no growth. And that's actually one of the, you know, one of the reasons I ended up switching jobs a little while ago, uh, you know, to work at the company I'm at right now is because I got so good at my job and it was great. It, it, 
it was it wasn't as much fun. I'd done it for a while and it had been very good to me, but I wanted something new. I wanted to shake yeah. it up a little bit. And I think that's important. That's the, for me, it's the adventure. That's the spice to life. And it, mm-hmm. it gets me excited to get up in the morning. If I've got the same thing every single day, all day, I just, it doesn't excite me. Same. I just start slowly start to feel kind of dead inside. <laughs> it's like, there's gotta be something like that, that, um, lights up your soul a little bit and challenges you. You know, I think that's yeah. like a basic human need is to have a little bit of challenge, a little bit of growth, something that um, ignites us on the inside. And it's Love funny that. that it's funny that you're saying that. Cause I, I was literally, um, debating on an Instagram post this morning between complacency is the enemy of growth. And I also was talking about, um, <laughs> I wrote, that's cool. You push the, push the edge and found a new level, but don't forget there are infinitely more levels. Keep pushing the edge. So, so like we've been on that's the right. same, I guess I was getting, uh, <laughs> prepared for our interview today, but that's what I'm hearing <laughs> from you is like, you just, you're like, Oh, skiing bl- double black diamond. Now it's time for <laughs> hella skiing, you know, like that's yeah. just, it's amazing. Yeah. I'm excited to, go to from see- here. <laughs> yeah. I'm excited to see what you're up to in a few years. We'll have to have you back on the show and you'll be like, guess what I did. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. It's fun though. It's, yeah. Uh, you know, I think, um, it, it's, it's, if you never, if you never dare to, to do something different, then how do you know what you're, you know, what you could have done, what you could have been, yeah, what you should have been. And that to me is, <laughs> we talk about fear, right. And I, <laughs> I I like to, I like to think about fear, but not fear in a vacuum. I like to think about every fear has a counter fear Mm. and growing up, you know, I, I I got my job out of college. I had to move to Atlanta. I I wasn't from Atlanta. I was moving from Knoxville Mm. and I got a job with a great company, you know, a, a top consulting firm, technology consulting firm. And I had an opportunity to take a job with Capital One, much safer, sort of less travel, more routine. But I knew that this consulting job was was the better job. And so I've not been one to take the path of least resistance just because mm-hmm. it's has least resistance. And so I started thinking about the fact that I was moving to Atlanta. I didn't know the area. My support system, I had no support system in Atlanta. I'd just gone blind a year and a half earlier. I just got a guide dog uh, before that. And there was no delivery service. I wasn't sure how I was going to get my groceries. I wasn't sure how would I get around? How would I do my job? The more I thought about it, the more terrified I became. Mm -hmm. And I started, you know, my parents would ask me, my friends would ask me, is everything okay? You excited? Like, yeah, I'm excited. I'm really excited. (laughs) What 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 I hid from them is that deep down inside, I was absolutely terrified. But again, this, what would future Chad be okay with? Would future Chad be okay with not trying this new adventure because it sounded too tough or not knowing whether or not I could, I have reached my full potential. Seriously. I've got one life to live. And so there's the fear of failing, which is fine. And then there's the fear of having regrets There's the fear of of not knowing what's possible. There's the fear of not reaching my full potential. And so anytime in life we have a fear, whether it's the fear of moving to a new city or taking on a new job, there's always going to be that fear of failure. The question I would pose to people is, what is your counter fear? Which fear can you live with most? Which fear are you going to allow to dominate your decision making? Because When our time has come, right, nobody wants to go to their grave with unmet potential. The most terrifying thought for me is knowing that I could have been who I dreamed of being if I'd only had the courage to push through. Mm -hmm. And so which one are we going to allow to dominate us? Yeah, I resonate with that completely. It's funny you say that because I ended up, I didn't post either of those on Instagram, but I went live this morning and I talked about one of my biggest fears is regret. And I think I learned that from marathon running, um, you, you, you know, it's a long ways, 26 miles and, you know, mile three, mile seven, mile 14, mile 18, 20. I mean, they're, they're long, a mile's pretty yeah. long, you know, it's like, you're out there for a yeah. while yeah. and it's like the ultimate mindset journey, because that what would drive me the entire time 
was this thought of, I would imagine myself laying on my couch, watching a movie that night, eating everything I ever wanted to eat. (laughs) And I would think this is all going to be over soon. And I don't want to look back at mile three or mile four or mile 11 or mile 23 and be like, damn it, dude, you could have pushed further on that one. You could have, you, you knew you you almost had placement, right? So, yeah. So I, I just, for me, yeah, I do. I do have a fear of, of, of regret. Like, I, I don't want that feeling ever of like, damn, I could have tried harder, you know? So thank you for, for saying that I feel exactly the same way. It's, um, there's always going to be a fear. Like you're saying, there's always going to be some sort of fear. And I personally, I don't believe in failure. I, I, I only believe in growing. So it's mm-hmm. like, okay, mm-hmm. well, it didn't work out, but you learned a lot of stuff. Right. So how was that a failure? You know, that's how I see that's it. Right. So fa- yeah, failure. it's not as binary as, as a lot of people want to make it out to be, right? Yeah, you, it's an experience. You got an experience. You got wisdom. That's not failing. Mm-hmm. That's just w- the way you thought that was going to work didn't work. Cool. Now you know a bunch of stuff about what doesn't work and you probably learned some other cool things about yeah, it too. Something so. different. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Try again. <laughs> yeah. Well, Chad, thank you so, so much for... Uh, like finding your true North and like <laughs> having that moment where you were like, ah, oh, great. I have to do this. <laughs> Thank you for that's doing a, it. So you can come share. That's literally story. how I felt when it happened. It was like, <laughs> Oh no, <laughs> here we go. Because I wasn't really someone who was eager to get up in front of people and speak. You know, I yeah. had always been good at presenting when I was at, in, at work and presenting deals, but presenting deals is different as you know, than, giving a, a keynote presentation or get, uh, conducting a workshop. It's just, a, it's a totally different thing. So it was definitely yeah. outside of, outside of my comfort zone. But again, I kept asking myself, well, if you really believe getting outside of your comfort zone is a good thing, <laughs> it's time to put up or shut up, right? What are you going to do? It's awesome. So That's so awesome. I, I love it. And I love that. Like you have this um, very like mathematical, strategic mind, which is so helpful for teaching these kind of things too, because you're like how you talked about how you'll go from, um, having this like idea or vision and ac- actually implementing it into your life. Like that's kind of your special sauce is like actually getting the implementation and the strategy into your life. Right. Which is just like, you know, with anything you go to a therapy session. Okay, cool. You dug up a bunch of stuff. You don't integrate any of that. It's like, it's just like, just to make you feel <laughs> like you did something, but you didn't actually, right. you know, like, and so right. that's, it's cool that, you know, your mind definitely is in that, uh, that way, that mode of operation of strategy implementation, which ma- actually makes you a very effective writer, a very eff- effective teacher, because people walk away and they actually have some things that they can start integrating into their life. So it's, it's pretty cool um, to like translate that tech business strategy guy consultant over to consultant for mindset, you know? <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's- yeah, exactly. Well, it's like I always say, you know, dreams without actions are, are worthless, right? You've got to be able right. to take an action. If you can't identify the next action you're going to take, then what's the point of us having the conversation, right? It's, it's great to be inspired. It's great to be motivated. But if you're not going to do anything different tomorrow as a result of it, yep. um, then it, it didn't hit the mark, right? You're going to have to change something. Yep. You're nicer than me. I'm like, everybody has a dream. You're not special. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's just the difference in who actually does it or not. And if you're going right. to keep talking about it for 20 years, I don't actually even want to hear about it anymore. Cause it's making me depressed that you're not doing it. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. Uh, yeah. good ideas with that actions. That's, you know, that's all that is, is progress prevention, right? What you have yep. to do at, at the end of the day is all right, what am I going to do? And I, I talk about this in some of my classes as well. When I talk about a bold vision of greatness, right? I, I want people to be really, really daring. So what is your most daring vision of greatness for yourself? And it has to be really bold and really inspiring because it's going to be a lot of work to get there. And then when it gets into execution, all right, now it's just the opposite. I don't want you to pick the boldest vision of, of action. I want you to pick the smallest possible action. Love it. To start creating some inertia because it's not about trying to do some big hard task tomorrow. It's about starting to develop the muscle memory that you can get this repetition in. And so when I talk to people, I used to be a personal trainer once upon a time, you know, it's, it's a, uh, and I use this metaphor to help out, but you know, I'm not asking people to go to the gym tomorrow and work out for two hours. I'm asking right. people, you know what, you don't even have to work out. Just go to the gym tomorrow for the next two weeks and sit there 
for 10 minutes. You didn't have to work out. The hardest part isn't working out. The hardest part is getting there consistently. Yeah. Once you get there consistently, the effort will naturally take care of itself. Eventually, you're going to get bored and go, well, if I have to sit here for 10 minutes, I may as well do something, right? right. And then that 10 minutes becomes 20 or 30 or 40. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you develop the lifestyle as opposed to, well, I'd really like to lose weight, but gosh, I don't want to go work out for an hour. And it's, it's, it's real hard to do. Yeah, it's it's those small, tiny little steps that tell your brain that you can do it and create the inertia that you need to get to where you want to be. Yeah, I love that so much. I have my clients do one thing. Okay, cool. You want to pay off five homes in the next five years? Okay, cool. What's one thing you can do this week? One thing this week, you know, and, and I, for me, that's, it's so helpful to just be able to have these small wins like that. Just one little piece of implementation. I'm going yeah. to talk to someone I know who is a real estate investor this week and just see, pick their mind. Okay, great. Awesome. You know, and it's just that little, it's just Progress. like you're saying, I look at it as like a, a snowball, you know, and at first with that snowball, like sometimes you got some wet snow in it, just like it won't clump together. Right. And it can right, feel like that. Right. It can feel like that at first, but then once you finally start packing it, you're like, okay, I got a snowball. That's when it starts to get exciting. And it's still just this tiny little snowball yeah, yeah. in your hand, because now but then you you're motivated you to right? grip on <laughs> what's that. But, but then you're motivated because you, you see the progress and it's, right. it's exciting. It's, it's motivating. It's empowering. Yes. It's yeah. It's, it makes me, once I get a little bit of success somewhere, it makes me bloodthirst for more. <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> it's just, it's just fun. It's fun to see what we're capable of, you know? So well, we're um, all capable of more than we, we think is possible. All of us are. Yes, definitely. And it's fun to explore that. Right. Cause it's like, no matter what you've achieved, it's like, there's, I mean, if I've already achieved this, like, shoot, what else is possible? This is fun. You know, it just becomes exactly like a game. <laughs> exactly. Um, all right. Exactly. So Chad, the best place for people to find you, if you guys aren't watching on YouTube, you can see, if you are watching on YouTube, you can see um, it's Chad E. Foster across the board. You're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Um, his website is chadefoster.com. And then um, the book, is it blindambitionbook.com is the book website? Yes, that is the book website. They can okay. also link to it off of my page and it's cool. on Amazon. It's on Barnes and Noble, Barnes and Noble, Apple, uh, bookshop books a million wherever wherever books are sold basically it's through harper collins so it's, it's awesome. pretty much anywhere that you buy books it's on audible there's an audio version there's a kindle version there's hard copy um, so awesome wherever people like to read they should find it there okay awesome thanks so much and then if if, if any you know business owners are interested in reaching out to you just through your website is how they contact you yeah there's uh there's an inquiry form there. If they go to my, my homepage, chattyfoster.com, they can click on videos or programs and see what programs I offer and a sizzle reel of some videos and they can inquire right there. They can also call my 800 number, which is 855-GET-CHAD. Nice. And that rings the team and we can, we can set something up. There we go. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chad. I got, I'll let you get going because I know you got to jump off to it on a flight to go do another speech. So um, thank you. But thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to share your story with us, to share all the insights, the nuggets, the practical um, reality of you having that moment of like, shoot, I need to do this. And now here you are. It's so cool to see, you know, so thank you so much for coming and sharing with us today. Well, I appreciate the opportunity. It's great to have the conversation. So it was fun. I enjoyed it. Me too.